Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. Mom, a small girl's quiet voice echoed. It seemed to come from an empty room. Mom, don't leave me, she said from the darkness. The woman peered into the gloom, trying to make out her child, but all she could see was mist. Where are you, Laura, her mother asked, straining to see anything at all. Mom, I'm here. Mom, don't leave me, don't go, the little voice called, filled with fear and hope for rescue. Laura, honey, where are you, the mother repeated, full of confusion. Her pulse quickened, and her body tensed. Sweat broke out above her lip. Her hair stuck unpleasantly to her skin. Karen appeared before her eyes. The woman blinked, trying to clear her vision and get rid of the blurry spots. The girl's voice was coming from different directions. The woman turned around, trying to determine where her daughter was. From the darkness, a child's cries began to reach her. The little one was calling for her mother's help. Mom, don't go, I'm scared, mom, mom. The girl's scream pierced through the woman. She jumped up, propping herself on the bed with her elbow. Her face was covered in tiny beads of sweat. Her heart raced, and her hands were still clenched into fists. A woman named Linda was trying to pull herself together after yet another terrifying dream. She knew she had to find her daughter. Linda threw off the blanket and swung her legs over the side of the bed, preparing to step into the hallway. But at that moment, three doctors in white coats entered the room. Quick, sedative, double dose, said a tall man with blue eyes. It's okay, Linda, it's okay. Don't worry, I'm here, it will all pass, the psychiatrist in the mental health facility where Linda was being treated assured her. Mr. Close, Linda began, gripping his arm. I keep having that nightmare, I'm sure, but she didn't finish her sentence. Shh, shh, the doctor interrupted her, you need peace and rest. And what could be better than a healthy, deep sleep? He said with a smile that somehow remained on his face. Please, I have to help her, Linda pleaded, trying to convince the doctor. I have to save my little girl, she repeated. Everything will be fine, the doctor said again, ignoring the patient's words. A few seconds later, the medication the nurse had injected began to take effect. Linda felt her muscles weaken and a wild drowsiness wash over her. The doctor helped her lay her head back on the pillow. I have to save my little girl, she whispered, after which her fingers released the doctor's arm, and she fell into a deep sleep. Susan, the doctor addressed the nurse, please keep track of the injections, don't miss the medication times, he said sarcastically. He was unhappy that the patient's episodes hadn't subsided. Linda had been hospitalized for about a year. She received treatment in a ward along with other patients. Her day started with breakfast and medication, followed by a short walk and then more medication. After talking with her doctor, there was dinner, more medication, and then bedtime. It was a beautiful sunny day, and Linda was walking near a blooming apple tree. Then the woman stopped and approached the flowers closely, so much so that the soft white pink petals covered her face, eyes, and lips. She inhaled the delicate fragrance of the freshly bloomed flowers, which transported her to a distant past. Mommy, find us, rang out the voices of children. Two twin girls, no more than three years old, were playing in the garden. They hid behind the garden's plantings and called for their mother to find them. Just a minute, the mother said, pushing through the small apple tree bushes that were already bursting with blooms. The flower buds brushed against her cheeks and lips, leaving behind a feeling of tenderness. Mom, her daughter Maria called playfully, bursting into childish laughter. Linda Davis, what are you doing over there, the doctor's voice called. It's been a while since lunch. Everyone is in the cafeteria, and you're still here, Mr. Close said. Linda lowered her head, feeling guilty. If you keep acting like this, I'll have to ask Susan to give you an extra dose, Mr. Close said sternly, relishing his power over the defenseless patient. Sorry, Mr. Close, I just got lost in the flowers, they're so beautiful, they reminded me of my daughters, Linda said. Linda Davis, you only have one daughter, remember that, 
the doctor said in a slightly raised voice, then added, softening, you're upsetting me. For lunch, they served chicken soup, vegetable salad, and a small bowl of various capsules that they called vitamins and dietary supplements here. Linda silently sipped her soup, trying to recall the memories flooding back to her. She clearly remembered her daughter Maria, but the second girl, it seemed, was named Laura. She heard that name over and over in her dreams. Maria and her daughter would visit her in the hospital, but those visits were very rare. The doctors feared she might unintentionally harm Linda. The woman didn't resist. Instead, she wanted to recover quickly and return to her daughter. But the attending physician continued to share increasingly discouraging notes about her condition and mental state each day. Linda trusted her doctor and believed that one day she would manage to recover and become a normal, healthy person again. Mr. Close was Linda's attending physician. They had known each other for a long time. The man had even tried to court her. But Linda didn't take his gestures seriously. After all, she loved another man, Richard, that was her beloved's name and Maria's father. He had come to their town to work on the gas pipeline. Linda worked as an office manager. Richard had a certain charm, he was handsome, strong, and well-read. Compared to the other guys, he stood out with his manners and the way he articulated his speech. In just a few minutes, he could convince everyone of his decision and that it was the only right choice. No one could argue with him. Soon, he got promoted and was transferred to work in another city. Linda couldn't leave her elderly parents, so she decided to stay in her hometown for the time being. Richard and Linda had many plans for their future. And as we know, good income is necessary to make plans come to life. Richard worked and visited every three months to see his beloved. Then they decided that Richard would earn a living and settle in another city while Linda took care of her parents. But that year, the flu epidemic took both of their lives. Linda buried her father and then her mother. It was decided that she would complete her contract for a couple of years and then move to Richard. However, six months later, she found out she was pregnant. The news left her a bit flustered, she was confused. It all happened unexpectedly, but Antonio came to her aid. He had always been there for Linda, using every opportunity to sway her to his side. Antonio invited her for casual meetings at cafes and provided support when she was feeling down or overwhelmed. Unlike Richard, Antonio was always nearby and ready to offer emotional support and a shoulder to lean on. Linda was very grateful for Antonio's kindness. But he didn't just want her gratitude. He began to hope for more. He wanted to capture all of her attention, her heart, and her body. One time, Antonio invited Linda to a café. She was already six months pregnant. When Richard learned about the news, he immediately rushed to her side. But for some reason, his visit was quite brief, and afterward, he couldn't come back due to various business matters and important negotiations. Antonio was almost the only person with whom she could share her feelings and simply talk. Linda, hello, my dear. How are you? How's the baby, he asked, gently hugging her and kissing her cheek. Oh, thank you, Antonio, I'm fine, thank God, she replied. Are you hungry? Let's order something because we don't know what the little one in my belly is thinking, right? He smiled and handed the menu to the expectant mother. When the waiter brought the food, Linda was indeed hungry. The appetizing aroma and appearance of the dishes instantly stimulated her appetite. She glanced at the spread on the table. Antonio always ordered a lot of food and paid for everything himself. When Linda offered to contribute, he would get upset and show through his demeanor that he really didn't like it. Once, he even cried, completely shocking Linda. This all looks so delicious, Antonio. Thank you so much. You're always so generous and kind to me. Thanks, she said as she enjoyed the grilled vegetables and meat in creamy sauce. Come on, Linda, it's nothing, Antonio replied. The main thing is that you and your baby are healthy. So, how are you doing, he asked, placing his hand on her belly. In that moment, he looked at Linda with genuine affection. She returned the sentiment, but with a different meaning. Antonio, why don't you start a family? It's about time. 
There are many nice girls in our city, Linda said. Well, as you know, nobody catches my eye, he replied sincerely, then popped another piece of meat into his mouth, dipping it in mustard sauce. There really isn't anyone? Linda wanted to press for more details from Antonio. The man fell silent. After swallowing the meat, he looked at her, taking in her light hair that cascaded softly over her shoulders. He then brushed his fingers through her hair and gently stroked her cheek. Leaving her without an answer, he moved on to dessert. Let's taste this. What do we have here from the pastry chefs, he said, digging his fork into the cheesecake. After trying a piece, he expressed his admiration for its excellent flavor. Then he pushed the dessert plate aside. His expression became serious. To be honest, Linda, Antonio hesitated to say it out loud. What? Linda asked, savoring the rich taste of the cake. To be honest, I would like to spend my life with you, but, he paused again. Unfortunately, you've made a choice that doesn't favor me. Linda was taken aback by this declaration, she had always thought of them as just good friends, especially since he often mentioned that he liked light-haired and delicate girls, while Linda was a brunette and a sturdy woman. But she decided not to delve into details, especially since her heart was already taken. When Linda gave birth, Richard came to her. He was overjoyed to become a father. Throughout the time he was with her, he was caring and attentive. Linda needed him more than ever. During Richard's visit, Antonio had to take a back seat. He tried to stay out of sight when Richard was around. But once, he couldn't avoid an encounter. Richard and Linda were strolling through the park together with the stroller. Antonio saw Linda first, but he had no intention of starting a conversation with her. Burying himself in a psychology magazine he always bought at the newsstand, he pretended not to notice the couple. Oh, Antonio, hello, she greeted him. But the man stubbornly continued reading the pages of the magazine. Antonio. Linda called to him. He perked up and looked at Linda and her husband with a seemingly confused expression. Didn't you recognize me? Linda asked, smiling at him. Oh, I didn't recognize you right away. Hi, I got caught up in a really interesting article, Antonio said, laughing as he threw quick glances at Richard. The man extended his hand in greeting. They shook hands. This is my husband, Richard, Linda said. And this is Antonio, my old acquaintance. Antonio interrupted her. Let's just say, my closest friend, the doctor said, looking at Richard, squinting his eyes. Antonio tried to be polite, but in reality, he couldn't stand seeing Linda with anyone else. It made him uneasy, and only his ability to behave in public and keep his composure helped him hide his true feelings. After a brief conversation, Antonio quickly made his excuses and left, citing work commitments. Linda placed her hand on the stroller and continued her walk with her husband. Later on, Richard left for another city again, visiting Linda every three months. The housing situation was dragging on, so Linda had to stay in her town for a while longer. Antonio continued to love Linda. Every time they met, he seized the opportunity to remind her that his heart was always open to her. How was your day? Antonio asked when Linda met him at the cafe. She had just fed the baby and placed her back in the stroller. She wearily looked at him. Just a typical day, she replied, laughing. I've been busy with motherhood since morning. Well, you know, I'm happy. I'm really glad to be a mom. Nothing can replace this wonderful feeling, Linda sincerely replied, taking a sip of cool compote. Divine. This is what I've been missing, she said joyfully. Antonia watched her, loving everything about her, every strand of hair, every pore. Now that Richard was gone again, Antonio could enjoy being with Linda once more. After giving birth, she had become even more attractive. Her natural charm and magnetism were more pronounced, which Antonio couldn't help but notice. However, his love for Linda took on an unhealthy shape. Antonio convinced himself that he was a worthy rival to Richard and that, in time, Linda would surely come to love him and forget about Richard. But nothing of the sort was happening. 
When Richard came to visit Linda again, he announced that he would be staying there, and Antonio nearly lost his mind with rage upon hearing this. Here's how it went down, Richard had been transferred back to the town where Linda lived. During a routine medical checkup, he coincidentally ran into Antonio. Hey, there. Richard greeted him, broad-shouldered, chest out, always in a good mood, in contrast to Antonio, who was also tall but had slumped shoulders and a weary, jaded look of a tired doctor. Good day. What brings you here? Antonio asked, guessing what the answer would be. Work, so to speak, I've been transferred back. I'll be here for a while, Richard said cheerfully. At least I'll be close to family, he added. I think so too, Antonio replied, nearly choking on the words he heard. Antonio felt a rush of blood to his face and a throbbing in his temples. Well, I wish you luck, he said, signing the appropriate document. After hearing that Richard had been transferred for work to his town and that Linda would now always be living with him, Antonio seemed to have been replaced. He became nervous and irritable, plagued by obsessive thoughts. Karen, Mr. Close pressed a button to call his secretary. Karen, bring me my favorite tea. And please don't forget my capsules, my head is aching again, he said, an exhausted expression on his face. Okay, Mr. Close, I'll get it right away, Karen, a young college senior, mumbled. She had recently started working as a secretary at the psychiatric hospital. Antonio had once studied at the same institute where Karen was now finishing her studies. He had been a diligent student. After graduating, he immediately got a job at the hospital and quickly became the chief physician of the city's psychiatric hospital. Here's your pill, Linda Davis. Please take it, Susan said, bringing a bowl of yellow capsules. Linda calmly took the pill, placed it in her mouth, and washed it down with water. Why did you take that? asked one of the patients in the hospital. She was an older woman with disheveled hair. She looked at Linda and nervously bit her lower lip. Why did you do that? Why? They didn't do anything to you, nothing. They didn't do anything, she repeated. Then she raised her right hand and started drawing circles in the air. They didn't do anything, nothing. Why did you take them? Why? Two male orderlies hurried over to the woman. They took her by the arms and helped her walk from the cafeteria to her room. Linda watched her go, then got up herself and headed to her own room. In the hallway, she bumped into a girl. The girl was gazing out the window, smiling genuinely as if there was truly something there. Linda walked past her and began to feel drowsy. This always happened after taking medication. The woman lay down on the couch and fell asleep. This time, Linda slept until evening, not even getting up for dinner. She felt weak and extremely thirsty. Calling for a nurse, she asked for some water. Susan entered with a glass and something else in her hand. Then she handed Linda a capsule and water. After confirming that Linda had indeed taken her medication, she returned to her duties. Linda sank back into the pillow. She felt her body growing heavier, her eyelids lowering like a thick curtain. In another minute, darkness enveloped her, carrying her consciousness far away. Mom, please don't leave me, a child's voice rang out. Mom, I'm scared, the child said. Linda got out of bed and looked out the window. It was open. The night sky was shining with stars. She felt the cool air. Mommy, don't leave me here, the child repeated. Where are you? Linda asked, finding herself outside. The fog wrapped around the woman's bare legs. I'm down here. Mom, help me, the girl's voice called, sending chills down the mother's spine. Laura. Linda exclaimed. Laura, where are you? She asked. I'm down here, Mom. Help me, I'm scared, the girl cried. Don't be afraid, I'm coming, the mother replied as she followed the voice into the unknown. She walked through the grass, the wet leaves sticking to her feet. The woman desperately tried to find her daughter. She looked around, straining to see in the darkness, but she just couldn't understand where she might be. Mom. Mom, echoed the voice somewhere in the distance. 
Linda opened her eyes, it was morning, and a girl was standing in front of her. She held a pillow in her hands and kept repeating the word, Mom. Linda still remembered her dream. Blinking, she rubbed her face with her hands. Her head throbbed unbearably, the pain worse than when she had asked for water. Another patient, an older lady with a short haircut, came over and sat beside her. Looking around, she moved closer to Linda. Headache, she asked, smiling. Then she looked around again. I'm going to pretend I'm sick. In reality, I'm fine, I just lost my temper once, she said. And what's wrong with that? It happens to everyone, she added. Linda couldn't understand why this woman had approached her, as they had never spoken before. Do you think I'm telling you this for no reason? Here's why, she said, pulling out a fabric pouch. Opening it, she showed how many pills she had collected over the week. See, she asked. Linda shook her head. My friend told me not to take these, they're poison, she exclaimed and laughed. All these pills turn a person into a vegetable, she said. Just try not taking them for three days, and you'll see how much better you feel. But there's one condition, you can't let them know. Those doctors have a plan they have to stick to. My name is Teresa, she said, laughing again. Her face flushed with color. At that moment, Susan entered the room. Teresa continued to laugh and then returned to her bed. Susan approached Linda and offered her the capsule with water again. Linda sat up in bed and, pretending to scratch her forehead, looked at Teresa. Then she took the capsule, put it in her mouth, and took a sip of water, after which she opened her mouth to show that she had swallowed the pill. Good job, said the satisfied nurse as she moved to the next bed. At that moment, Linda pulled out the capsule that hadn't had time to dissolve and slipped it under the mattress. Then she looked back at Teresa. The woman had closed her eyes, then opened them again. A week later, Linda indeed felt much better. Her mind was clearer, and her thoughts were more coherent. She began to understand how different she was from the other patients. In the absence of medication, she could comprehend what was happening better and see how the doctors were deliberately treating people like fools. One early morning, Mr. Close entered the ward where Linda was lying. Linda briefly forgot herself and almost told the chief doctor about her condition and that she felt healthy. But at the last moment, something stopped her from doing so. Linda Davis, the chief doctor said, bringing another batch of pills with him. Linda opened her mouth to say that she wouldn't need them, but Mr. Close, seeing her animated face, became interested and looked at her strangely. You don't look well today, should I increase your dosage? As sad as that sounds, he said, feigning regret. Linda immediately regretted giving herself away. Trying to revert to her previous state, she suddenly said, I saw my daughter today. She told me where she is. Now I know where she is, and I'm going to find her. She spoke with feigned excitement, wanting to convince Antonio of her words. However, the doctor decided to play it safe, so he opened his medical bag, pulled out a new syringe, and a clear vial filled with liquid. Seeing this, Linda slightly parted her lips and squinted her eyes, trying to hide her fear. Linda Davis, is something bothering you? Mr. Close asked, noticing a reaction from her he had never seen before. I'm afraid I won't see my daughter, she said, staring blankly into space. Mr. Close filled the syringe with medicine, approached Linda, disinfected her shoulder with alcohol, and injected the unknown substance. Don't worry, he said, you'll soon be able to see your Maria. The chief doctor then watched the woman for a moment. Seeing her eyelids growing heavier, he smiled faintly. He was pleased that Linda was finally under his control. When the doctor left, Teresa immediately rushed over to Linda. She shook her by the shoulders and lightly slapped her cheeks. You can't give yourself away, there are no friends here, Teresa said, trying to keep Linda's attention focused. Do you hear me, Linda? Answer me, she urged. Linda barely nodded her head, then slipped into a deep sleep. The next morning, Linda woke up with another headache. It felt like someone was trying to split her skull open and escape. Catching Teresa's gaze, Linda recalled her words from yesterday. During their walk, Teresa and Linda stayed close to each other, exchanging a few words. 
don't even think about telling anyone anything. And don't take any pills, her new acquaintance said, giggling after every phrase. Being of sound mind, Linda had to immerse herself in the role of a sick and mentally challenged woman. It was the only way she could exist in her consciousness while finding herself in the psychiatric hospital. You say you have a daughter, the woman asked Linda. Linda looked at her, as if pondering how to respond. Everyone says I only have one daughter, Maria, but I have this feeling inside me that I have a second daughter, and her name is Laura, Linda said. After saying those words, she felt a sense of relief. Is that why you ended up here? Teresa asked her. Linda hesitated to answer. How did you end up here? She asked again. Linda became lost in thought, trying to remember how it all began. She strained her memory, but the long-term use of medication had completely wiped that part away. Linda felt a flicker of anger inside her for not being able to recall such basic and significant things from her life. Don't worry if you can't remember right now. It's only been a short time since you stopped taking your medication. Just wait a bit longer, and your memory will surely come back, Teresa said, then stared at a fixed point and began to rock back and forth, dramatically pretending to be insane. Two weeks later, Linda was allowed to see her child. Her eight-year-old daughter Maria came to visit her mother in the hospital. Linda was indescribably happy, but the presence of the staff, including a male nurse, kept her from expressing her emotions. When Maria saw her mother, she approached her and said hello. Hearing her daughter's voice, Linda felt her pulse quicken. She wanted nothing more than to hug her. It took great effort for Linda to keep herself composed. The tears welling in her eyes spoke of her deep love for her daughter, while also reflecting her profound sorrow over the situation. Mom, do you not remember me at all? Maria asked. A little hand rested on her mother's arm. Linda flinched and took a deep breath, but her gaze remained fixed past her daughter. Linda kept repeating to herself, don't give in, hold on. I'm okay, Aunt Daphne loves me, and Uncle Horty does too, Maria said, sharing stories about her life in the new foster family she had been placed with after her mother was committed to a psychiatric hospital. Of course, Aunt Daphne sometimes gets mad at me for not preparing well for school. She says I have to be a good girl so I don't embarrass them, that I should be grateful to them for helping me, Maria explained. And Linda listened to every word, relieved to know that her daughter was safe and in good hands. Mom, I love you so much, Maria said and kissed her mother on the cheek. Linda remained still, as if no one was there beside her. Inside, however, she was torn apart, but only by maintaining this facade was she allowed to see her daughter. After saying, goodbye, the girl left the visitor's room. Aunt Daphne, who was waiting for her outside, inquired about the girl's conversation with her mother and then took her home. A medical worker approached Linda and helped her get up. He led her to her room, then brought a sedative to her mouth, gave her water to wash it down, and then helped her lie down on the bed. Linda lay there, waiting for the staff to leave the hospital. Once they did, she buried her face in the pillow and sobbed uncontrollably, weeping and weeping. What are you crying about? Teresa asked, trying to pull the blanket off Linda's head. I know you had a visit with your daughter. I'm really happy for you, she said quietly, then giggled three times, glancing around. Susan entered the room. Teresa began to pretend she was playing hide-and-seek with Linda. Peekaboo. Peekaboo. Teresa said, popping up on one side of Linda's bed, then the other. Teresa, Susan addressed her, stop bothering Linda immediately, she said in a stern tone. Teresa laughed in response but returned to her bed. Good job, Susan said. After checking on all the patients and handing out the necessary pills, the nurse left the room. Teresa immediately approached Linda. By this time, Linda had calmed down and wanted to talk to Teresa. You can send a note to your daughter, Teresa said. A note? Linda asked, genuinely surprised that this was even possible under the current circumstances. Looking around, she raised her arms up and began to stretch toward the ceiling, pretending to be ill. Yes, a note. Karen, a young worker at our hospital, can lend you a pen, Teresa said, watching Linda's hands as they painted invisible patterns in the air. But how? 
We don't even cross paths with her, Linda posed a reasonable question. When we go out for a walk, Teresa began, shifting her gaze from Linda's hands to her eyes, Karen cleans some of the rooms and leaves her workspace empty. We need to make sure we go out at the time when Karen is away from her post, and then we can grab a piece of paper and a pen to write a note, then pass it on to your daughter, Teresa finished. By that time, Linda was already tired of holding her arms up, and they fell lifelessly to her sides. It worked out. When all the patients went out for their walk, Teresa and Linda pretended to linger before exiting their room. Come on, please clear the room quickly, I need to freshen up the air, Karen said, a pretty girl who hadn't yet tasted the full flavor of working in this place. With drooping shoulders, Teresa and Linda shuffled down the corridor one behind the other. Linda glanced at her pale gray uniform, which she had been wearing all this time. Teresa smiled constantly and looked around. As they passed by Karen's desk, Teresa deftly snatched a small sheet of paper and, without stopping, moved forward down the hallway, hiding the paper from view. Linda followed behind. Noticing a pen, she quickly reached behind the small reception desk and grabbed the first object she could find at random. It turned out to be a pencil. Linda slipped it into her sleeve and continued outside. The walk proceeded as usual. When she met Teresa on the street, Linda took the paper from her and, along with the pencil, hid them closer to her body. After the walk and lunch, they returned to their ward. Mr. Close came in almost immediately and began examining everyone in the room. When he reached Linda, he looked at her carefully once more. How are you feeling today, he asked, peering into the woman's eyes. It's hard to say. I just feel okay, and a bit sleepy, Linda replied, looking past the doctor. Mr. Close patted Linda on the head and moved on to another patient. Linda was unpleasantly surprised to realize that her close friend was not who he pretended to be. This was very hard to accept. But for the sake of her own survival, Linda was willing to come to terms with this and continue with her behavior strategy. After some time, she was allowed to see her daughter again. Maria was very happy that she could see her mother once more. As before, the girl came with Aunt Daphne. Once they were alone, she began telling her mother about her life. Mom, my mommy, she started, placing her warm little hands on her mother's. Do you remember me? I know you do, I'm sure of it. Do you remember how we used to live together? We walked in the forest and picked flowers. The soft, gentle grass tickled our bare feet. Do you remember? You loved that. And so did I. But Aunt Daphne doesn't like to walk barefoot. She says it's bad for your health and dangerous because there are lots of insects and bugs in the ground. Maria paused, as if recalling something. Then, smiling, she continued. We recently went to the river together, and there was a bumblebee floating on the water. It accidentally fell in. I tried to save it. While I was saving it, Aunt Daphne got all worked up. She yelled at me and shouted, but I still managed to pull it out. No, no, I didn't go into the river. I reassured my mother, even though she didn't show any sign of concern. I brought a long stick and helped it grab onto it. The bumblebee crawled out, dried off, and flew away. Linda sighed. Maybe she doesn't remember me now, she thought. She was looking at her mother's face, which was sad. Her eyes were welling up with tears. But Linda held on. She fought with all her might against her emotions. She worried that her daughter might not come again or might not understand her properly, or worse, might foolishly tell the doctor everything. Maria squeezed her mother's hands, and Linda responded in kind. Maria suddenly perked up, but upon looking at her mother, she decided it meant nothing. Just then, the door opened, revealing the face of a medical worker. Time's up. You have one minute to leave, said the young man in a sleepy voice. He was working too much and couldn't get enough rest. Well, that's it, mommy, I have to go, Maria said, regretting that the fifteen minutes had flown by so quickly. The girl stood up but felt her mother holding her hand. Then she sensed something in her palm. Instinctively, Maria decided not to say anything to anyone about it. She looked at her mother, who, surprisingly, was staring intently at her. 
In her eyes was a plea for help. The daughter froze in silence. But something told her to keep quiet. It was too strange to see a mentally ill person holding a note with a pleading look for assistance. Maria slipped the note into her pocket and, after saying, goodbye, left to find Aunt Daphne. Aunt Daphne never entered the visiting room to see Linda. First, she had little to talk about with Linda, and second, she didn't want to disturb the sick woman unnecessarily. That day, Maria left the psychiatric hospital feeling full of life. She couldn't wait to find out what was written in the note her mother had given her. When they got home, Aunt Daphne asked Maria to help her set the table. The girl obediently carried out her foster mother's tasks. Overall, Aunt Daphne was a good woman and, as expected of foster parents, raised the girl with strictness so she wouldn't become unruly or allow herself too much freedom. For lunch, they had noodle soup and Uncle Horty's favorite salad. He folded the newspaper and set it aside before pulling his plate closer. The meal, as always, was eaten in complete silence. Everyone was lost in their thoughts and then dispersed to their rooms for various activities. Maria, eat carefully, Aunt Daphne admonished when the girl accidentally dropped a piece of bread in her lap. Maria couldn't wait for lunch to end so she could return to her secret place and read the note from her mother. Don't you want any tea? Aunt Daphne asked. Maria placed her empty plate in the sink and thanked her for the soup. Not right now, thanks, the girl replied, trying to keep her appearance neutral. You came back from your mother's looking so pensive. Did she say something to you? Aunt Daphne asked. No, Aunt Daphne, mom still doesn't say anything, but at least we're seeing each other more often than a month ago, Maria said, looking her aunt in the eye. Well, all right. Go ahead, but don't take too long, Aunt Daphne said, popping a jam-filled cookie into her mouth. Maria left the house, then out through the gate, and then hurried to the far end of the village. Here, a bit away from the main cottages, stood an abandoned hut. No one had lived there for a long time. It had faded gray from the sun, rain, and wind. From the outside, it looked a bit eerie, with a dilapidated roof and an old fence. Tall bushes, nettles, and lambs' quarters grew everywhere. Maria had stumbled upon this little house while walking along the river. At that time, she was captivated by a small flock of crows sitting on the roof of the hut. The blackbirds were watching the girl, and she was watching them. Maria thought maybe one of them needed help. The birds didn't fly away even when Maria approached them very closely. As she pushed through the dense lamb's quarters and couch grass, the girl brushed against some stinging nettle a couple of times. Red blisters immediately formed on her arm, making it itch. But that didn't stop her. Reaching the front yard, she opened the small, low gate. The crows became agitated. They began to call loudly and lean down, as if indicating that something was in the grass. Maria parted the flowering lilac branches with her hands and discovered a little chick below. It was a baby crow. It had gotten tangled in a net and hurt its foot, so it was afraid to fly. It looked to be about a month old. The girl knelt beside it. The chick, which had previously been making desperate cries, fell silent and stared at Maria. It looked at her with mature, almost wise eyes. It was serious and a little eerie. Sympathy for the chick overcame her fear, and the girl extended her hands toward it. The little crow watched her white palms intently, then scooted closer and climbed onto them. It seemed to like her. Maria couldn't take the chick home, as her foster family was against having animals in the house. So, without thinking too much, she opened the door to the hut and easily slipped inside. Sunlight poured in through the small dusty windows, illuminating the walls and floor. In the right corner stood a large oven, covered in lime that had also faded with time. There were wooden tables and chairs nearby, and at the other end of the room was a neatly made bed. How strange, Maria said. It feels like someone lived here a long time ago. The chick cawed and brought her attention back to it. Maria set it on the table. You must be hungry, she asked it. The chick responded with a loud caw. The girl began to think about what to do. In ten minutes, she was on her way with a piece of bread in her pocket for her new friend. The chick turned out to be quite greedy. 
In just a few minutes, it devoured the entire piece of bread and cried out for more. Maria was astonished by its incredible ability to consume food so quickly. When she accidentally stumbled upon a shovel in the yard, she started digging for earthworms for the crow. With a good supply of protein, the chick grew rapidly and transformed into a full-grown crow in no time. It flew with the other birds but always returned to the girl whenever she came to the hut. Maria enjoyed spending time there. She tidied up, organized the space, and came to consider the hut her second home. Just like now, when she stepped inside, she felt safe. Maria immediately unfolded the note. It read, No one must know this. I am being held in the hospital against my will. I have to pretend that I don't recognize you and that I don't understand what's going on. Help me escape from here. Your mom. Maria looked up, her heart racing, and her soul filled with joy, knowing her mother was healthy. But how could she get her out of there? Maria began pacing back and forth in the hut, contemplating possible options. Just then, there was a caw and a knock on the window. Maria approached the window and opened one of the sashes, letting the crow inside. It was no longer a chick. A large, strong, and imposing bird sat before Maria. The crow loved to perch on Maria's shoulder and stay there until it grew bored or until she shooed it away. Hey, Varric, that's what she named the bird. How can we get my mom out? How can I help her, she pondered aloud. Then she took out some stale bread, poured water into a mug, and, while soaking the pieces of bread, sent them one by one into the crows and her mouth. After that, they both went for a walk. The fresh grass tickled their feet, and the sun felt pleasant on their skin. I can't go on a date with you this time, Aunt Daphne said. The store has delivered supplies, I need to sort them. When will I find time, she complained, washing the dishes. Maria took a plate and dried it with a towel. I think you can handle it yourself. You're grown up now, right? She asked the girl. Maria nodded in agreement. Come on, you're already ten years old, and it's not your first time. She continued to reassure herself. Don't worry, Aunt Daphne, I can manage, there are doctors and nurses everywhere, Maria said as she placed the mugs on the shelf. And then came the day when Maria was going to visit her mother again. She had a backpack and a prepared note with her. The girl had to keep her emotions in check so she wouldn't throw herself at her mother. Linda slowly entered the visiting room and sat down in a chair. The young male nurse didn't really care much about following the rules. After opening the door for the woman and confirming she could walk on her own, he hurried to close the door and return to watching his favorite TV show. However, Linda and Maria remained alert and acted as they had agreed. I'm so glad to see you, my beloved mommy, Maria said, taking her mother's hands. Feeling the response to her squeeze, the girl felt encouraged. Her mother truly heard her and understood her. Remembering the note, Maria pretended to drop something on the floor while she discreetly slipped it into her mother's sock. How are they treating you here? Is it okay, the daughter asked. Linda closed her eyes to indicate a positive response. Are you taking your medication, the daughter asked again. Linda barely shook her head from side to side. Maria smiled. I don't know if we'll be able to do this, she said. Just then, the door to the visiting room opened, and Mr. Close walked in. With an air of importance, he greeted little Maria, making sure to put on a fake smile. Oh, do we have guests, he asked, surprisingly discovering Maria there with Linda. You've been visiting quite often, he said, waiting to hear Maria's response. While we're allowed to see each other, we have to take advantage of it, the girl said, getting a little flustered. Do you miss your mom? Mr. Close asked, feigning sympathy. Maria pondered how to respond. I'm getting used to it, but I still hold on to hope, she said, smiling back at the doctor. Linda maintained a disinterested expression, gazing past them both. Then she started shaking her head side to side. However, deciding she was overacting, she returned to her previous indifferent state. Mr. Close looked at Linda and held her gaze for a moment before turning back to the girl. I'm afraid I have to cut back on your frequent visits. Your mother needs peace to recover fully, the chief doctor said. 
I'm completely responsible for her, he added. Linda could barely restrain herself from screaming at him. Thanks to his efforts, she had become a powerless being with no rights. Inside, she trembled with anger at her so-called friend. Cut back, the girl asked again. But why? Mom is feeling better. Maria protested, looking at her mother. Linda kept her indifferent face. She felt like their plan was about to fall apart. Mom, please say you're feeling better, you understand everything. Mom, the daughter couldn't hold back any longer, demanding her mother tell the doctor the truth. But Linda simply stared straight ahead. Then the woman yawned widely, completely ignoring her daughter's pleas. Maria, Mr. Close addressed her, if you keep behaving this way, it could negatively affect your relationship, the doctor said. Finally, Maria collected herself, said, goodbye, to her mother, and left the visiting room. Meanwhile, Mr. Close helped Linda get up, looked her straight in the eyes, and smiled broadly. He once again felt his power over her. Maria returned home and greeted Uncle Horty before heading to her room. Aunt Daphne was still at work. She always came home late when new supplies arrived at the store. Uncle Horty worked shifts as a security guard, so he was often home. The girl pondered how to save her mother. Even though she had already laid everything out in the note, she still worried about how it would all go. Meanwhile, Linda returned to the ward and took out the note. In it, her daughter asked her to be ready on the holiday because Maria would come with a backpack containing clothes for her mother. Well, did your daughter respond? Teresa asked, chuckling. Linda nodded quickly. Are you in? Linda asked, although she didn't even know if she could take her with her. No, so what? I'll find a way out myself. Don't worry about me. I have someone who will help me get out of here if I need it, she said cheerfully. If you need help, just say so, she added. Linda wanted to hug Teresa, but just then, Susan walked into the room. After glancing at everyone with a scrutinizing look, she seemed to think about something in her head, then stepped back into the hallway. Teresa and Linda breathed a sigh of relief. I'm sure you'll make it, Teresa said. Despite the chief doctor's promised ban on Linda's visits, Maria still came as scheduled. Karen, who was at the reception, knowing Maria was coming to see her mother, let her through. The timing worked in their favor, as the visit coincided with the holiday. The staff at the psychiatric hospital were in a bit of a frenzy since it was family love and fidelity day. The doctors congratulated each other, exchanged gifts, and some even left work early to spend the day with their families. Susan was so busy due to the absence of other doctors that she didn't have time to check on the patients as she usually did. Even the guy who always escorted Linda to the visitor's room hurried off to the buffet organized for the doctors in the cafeteria. He was used to the visits between the girl and her mother happening in the usual boring routine, so there was nothing to worry about. Thus, Maria and Linda were left unsupervised. Hi, Mom. Maria exclaimed, rushing into her arms. Hello, my dear, hello. But we need to be careful, so let's get right to it, said the mother, who suddenly transformed from a lifeless vegetable into an active and completely healthy person full of energy. When Linda peeked out the door of the room, she spotted the white coat that Karen sometimes left on her work chair. The corridor was empty. Everyone was probably sent to the auditorium to watch a concert dedicated to the holiday. Without thinking twice, Linda dashed to the reception desk and grabbed the coat. Maria emptied her backpack filled with items for her mother that she had once taken from Aunt Daphne when they lived there after the fire. Linda put on the pants, blouse, and jacket, then topped it all off with the white coat. She also styled her hair into a bun and put on photochromic glasses. Here, look, Maria exclaimed, showing her mother the lipstick. This will distract them, she said. Maybe the opposite? Linda questioned, but she took the lipstick and applied it to her lips. After changing, Linda looked quite stylish and beautiful as a psychiatrist, which both she and Maria had planned based on the image of one of the local female doctors. It turned out to look quite similar. Finally, Maria handed her mother a bag and a bouquet of flowers. And what's this? the mother asked, looking at the bunch of white daisies, some of whose petals were slightly crumpled. 
It's a holiday today. You're off work. Did you forget, her daughter asked again? Oh, right, Linda replied. Just as they were about to leave, Susan walked into the room. Seeing the tall woman in a smart outfit, a white coat, and with glasses and lipstick on, she was taken aback. What's going on here, she asked in a stern yet surprised tone. We're waiting for the girl's mother, Linda, Linda replied, pretending to be the doctor. But I can't wait any longer, I've taken time off to go home. Why should I waste my time, she protested, leaving Susan stunned. But today isn't a visiting day. Actually, the visiting hours are over, and all the patients are in the concert hall. She turned to the girl. Your name is Maria, right? she asked. Yes, that's right, Maria replied, holding an open lipstick behind her back. Well, Maria, come back next week. And you can go now, she said, addressing Linda. Linda smiled broadly and thanked her colleague, then walked down the corridor toward the exit. Suddenly, Mr. Close appeared around the corner. He was walking straight down the corridor and seemed about to enter the room where Linda was. Linda's heart stopped, but she walked confidently forward, inhaling the scent of white daisies. Seeing the doctor, Maria decided to distract his attention. Isn't my mom coming today? she asked the chief doctor. Sweetheart, it's a holiday today, come back another time, Mr. Close replied, not stopping as he walked on. There, he met Susan, and together they began discussing something before turning left down the corridor. Linda quickened her pace. Looking back, she met her daughter's eyes. Maria was following her. One more door, then another, stairs. The woman breathed in the air. Was she really free? But it wasn't time to relax yet. Just a few more steps, and the psychiatric hospital would be behind her. Once Linda had walked a reasonable distance from her so-called job, she removed the coat and tucked it into her bag. It was a bit small, so she had to force it in. Maria caught up with her and instructed her to follow. Linda trusted her daughter, so she did everything as Maria said. Along the way, Linda wiped off the lipstick so it wouldn't stand out and tossed the daisies into the lake when they turned onto the field. Maria ran ahead and hid, waiting for her mother to come closer. They made their way to the hut at the very edge of the village. Mom. Mommy. Maria exclaimed, hugging her mother. We did it. I can't believe it. We made it, my dear. Linda repeated, holding her daughter tightly. Are you hungry? Maria asked. I'll get you some food. Aunt Daphne baked pies today, she said, disappearing through the door. Maria, her mother called after her. Whose hut is this? she asked. Don't worry, no one has lived here for a long time, Maria replied as she left the hut. Well, how's your mother doing? Is she feeling better? Aunt Daphne asked, who wasn't working that day. I didn't get a chance to see her today, Maria replied. Can I go out for a walk? she asked. Oh, go ahead, you can't sit at home all day, Aunt Daphne said, pouring herself some tea and heading into the living room. As she turned on her favorite show, she settled on the couch and took a bite of her bun. Maria checked to make sure her aunt wasn't watching, then opened her backpack and tucked a few pies inside. After grabbing a bottle of milk from the fridge, she left the house. How long are we going to hide, she asked her daughter when they both settled down at the table for a snack. Outside, the bright sun was shining, and the birds were singing, enveloping them in a carefree atmosphere as if nothing threatened Linda at that moment. Maria couldn't answer that question, she could only rejoice with her childlike heart that she was back together with her mom. Soon they'll start looking for me, Linda said, taking a bite of the liver pie. It had been so long since she had eaten homemade food. The bland diet in the psychiatric hospital had grown tiresome. You can stay here for now, her daughter replied. No one will figure out that you're hiding in this hut. And later, maybe we can think of something, Maria said, taking a sip of the rich milk. You're my savior, Linda said tenderly, stroking her daughter's back. The woman gazed thoughtfully at Maria. She was the spitting image of the girl who often visited her in her dreams. Despite the long period of medication that was supposed to restore the patient's mental state, 
the so-called hallucinations still felt very real to Linda. Maria, she addressed her daughter, I want to ask you something, but promise me you'll tell me the truth. Okay, Maria replied, sensing the seriousness in her mother's tone. The girl became serious and even a bit sad. Her features took on the appearance of an unhappy kitten, as if she understood what her mother was about to ask. I think I can't answer all your questions for your own good. That's what Dr. Mr. Close said, Maria added, finishing her milk. Hearing that name from her daughter made Linda's throat tighten. Please, my girl, I need to know the truth. I promise I'll keep my emotions in check, Linda pleaded with her daughter. Maria sighed and set her empty mug aside. Mommy, my dear, I really don't want to hurt you again, but if you insist, I'll tell you everything, Maria said, then began her story. You really have two daughters, me and my twin, Laura. Everything you said back then is true. Laura died in the fire, just like our dad, but Mr. Close asked me not to mention Laura because it would upset you and hinder your treatment, Maria explained, glancing at her mother apologetically. Linda was silent for a moment, then responded. I'm glad you told me, you've helped me so much. Now that my mind is clear and not clouded by medication, I know I've always been healthy. You need to help me with one more thing. I can only trust you, Linda said. At that moment, she felt full of courage and determination. I'm going to write a letter to the police, and you'll deliver it. Okay, she asked her daughter. Of course, Mom, Maria nodded. Next, Linda planned to act according to her plan. Meanwhile, the prisoners were practicing their escape tactics, preparing to flee from prison. Three friends, three thieves who had often been incarcerated for petty thefts, somehow always managed to get out. Then they would look for their next victim, get what they wanted, and hide among the townsfolk for a while. When they were eventually found, they would end up back in prison, and the cycle would repeat. It was like some kind of gambling game in which people consciously participated. However, this time the thieves had devised a longer-term plan that was supposed to ensure them a good life in the future. After somehow obtaining a map of the prison, the experienced thieves were able to come up with an escape plan. On one of the nights during the holidays, the three escapees, using a homemade key, managed to unlock their cell door and get into the corridor. Approaching the sleeping guard, they paused. You go first, one of them nudged the second on the shoulder. Me? asked the guy nicknamed Blacksmith, in a voice that sounded like a bleeding goat, he was thin and wiry. You lost yesterday, so you go, replied a burly man, tall and stocky, with a scar on his cheek. Blacksmith swallowed hard and took another look at the guard sitting in the chair. The guard was desperately fighting off sleep, dozing off every couple of minutes. The guy pulled out a handkerchief soaked in sleeping medication and, laying it flat on his palm, approached the officer. With a quick and careful motion, he threw the handkerchief over the guard's face, who only managed to open his eyes for a second before falling silently back to sleep. Blacksmith crumpled the handkerchief and stuffed it into his pocket, then took the keyring from the guard's belt. The three of them moved on down the corridor. The burly guy walked last. He couldn't help himself, leaning over the sleeping guard, he made a grimacing face, rolling his eyes and sticking out his tongue. The next door was opened with a deft turn of the key held by blacksmith. This guy had an incredible knack for picking any lock with ease. Come on, blacksmith, open the gates to our new life, the burly guy named Peter said with a wicked laugh. Blacksmith felt a slight wave of anxiety, as no one knew what awaited them beyond those gates. When the prison doors swung open, the three escapees couldn't believe their luck at escaping from prison again. Peter laughed and slapped blacksmith on the shoulder. The weight of Peter's heavy hand made blacksmith wobble slightly, but he kept his gaze forward. The third one, a guy named Bobby, looked at his friends, sniffled, rubbed his face with his hand, and spat on the ground. The three prisoners moved ahead, quickening their pace, then broke into a run. Now that the first part of the plan was complete and the prison cell was behind them, it was time to move on to the second part. They planned to grab some gold from the nearest village before heading to the big city. From there, with a fat wallet, they could make their way to the other side of the country. Bobby, a tall man with clenched teeth, ran, occasionally holding his right side. He felt a painful sensation there, but there was no time to stop. 
He lagged behind the others, slowing his pace, curling over, trying to catch his breath and ease the nagging pain in his body. Peter ran second. His massive build and poor physical condition prevented him from running at full strength. He ran, his belly shaking. His cheeks bounced, and sweat dripped from his forehead. The burly guy grumbled and muttered incoherently under his breath, casting quick glances at Blacksmith, who was leading the way. It seemed the very wind was pushing the guy forward, helping him cover the distance. Blacksmith, the burly guy bellowed. Blacksmith, stop. You hear me? We need to find a place to rest. I can't run anymore. Peter pleaded, trying not to lose his balance as his legs tangled. There's just a little more to go, Blacksmith replied. We'll reach the woods soon, and then we can find a hideout, he said, continuing to run. Blacksmith understood better than the others that a police search party might already be out looking for them. They're like little kids, I swear, Blacksmith thought, shaking his head from side to side. Finally, the forest came into view. The black trunks in the darkness formed a solid wall. Without considering where to jump in, Blacksmith pushed through the dry, falling branches and twigs. Then Peter crashed in right behind him, complaining loudly about life's unfairness. A couple of minutes later, Bobby burst through the wall of trees. Tripping over a protruding branch, he fell flat on his back. The soft moss cushioned his fall, preventing any serious injuries. He only suffered scratches and minor bruises. Once inside the dense forest, the escapees continued to run, wanting to put as much distance as possible between themselves and the prison. The village should be showing up soon, the burly guy said, coughing and breathing heavily. Yeah, just a bit more, I can smell it, Blacksmith said, prompting laughter from the others. Don't feed him bread, just let him cuddle with the cows and pigs, Peter said mockingly. What? I don't hide the fact that I love animals. I'd settle down and start a farm if I could, Blacksmith replied nonchalantly. Peter was surprised, shaking his head. Well, you've surprised me. I've known you for a while, and this is the first time I've heard something like that from you, said the burly guy, rubbing his recently bruised spot. Running his hand along his leg, he realized his pants were torn. People change, Blacksmith replied, easily maneuvering through the dense branches of the conifer. It was starting to get light, and the outline of a shed appeared ahead. Blacksmith quickened his pace. Bobby was dragging behind, struggling to keep up with his friends. His lack of physical fitness and neglect of his health were showing more than ever. There was a thud against the wood, followed by the creaking of dry boards. Blacksmith and Peter kicked in the old door to the shed and slipped inside. There was nothing in the shed except for old metal buckets and basins. Ignoring the dirt and cobwebs, the fugitives dropped down onto the wooden floor. What's wrong, Bobby, feeling under the weather, the burly guy asked looking at the man who was holding his hand on his right side. When the police catch us, they'll get you fixed up in no time, Peter joked. We need to act quickly. While it's still dark, we have to go house to house and make them share their treasures with us, Blacksmith said, hinting that it was time to go. Strangely enough, there were few dogs in the village, and the ones that were there were tied up and couldn't help their owners. The three escapees approached one of the cottages. Is anyone home? Peter asked, making his voice as pleasant as possible. I got a bit lost, is anyone home? I just need to find out the way, he continued, grinning as he glanced at his friends. A moment of silence passed at the door. Then it creaked open, revealing a woman in a long nightgown and an equally long robe. Straining to see in the dim light, she stepped aside to let him in. At that moment, along with Peter, two others barged through the door. Grabbing the woman, they waited for Peter's instructions. Bobby, he said to his friend, hold her while I ask her a few questions, Peter announced. Meanwhile, Blacksmith was already searching all the cabinets and other possible hiding spots for gold. I don't have anything, the woman said, holding back tears. Fear God, how can you do this, she pleaded, trying to reason with the strangers. Well, we'll find out if you fear God or not. You know it's wrong to lie, Peter replied, laughing again. He approached the window and drew back the curtain. 
On the windowsill sat three icons lined up in a row. Just what we were looking for, the burly guy said, pleased, then asked, a bag. I need a bag. You can find a bag in the kitchen, in the bottom drawer, the woman said, still unable to believe her eyes. Enough of holding her now, Peter barked at Bobby. Better find me a bag. Bobby seated the woman on a chair, then approached the cabinet and pulled out the bottom drawer. He had just grabbed the bag when a mouse squeaked. Bobby jerked his hand back and stepped aside. A tall, large man with a strong look of disdain on his face stared at the small gray animal, which sniffed around before darting under the table. Bobby, what's wrong with you? It's just a mouse. Peter exclaimed, utterly baffled. I'm terrified of those little creatures. Bobby replied, still grimacing at the memory. But it's just a mouse. Peter couldn't wrap his head around it. Meanwhile, Blacksmith was snickering as he rummaged through other corners and windows in the house. Bobby, on the other hand, felt embarrassed about his outburst. Finally, after the icons, gold chains, and wedding rings were tossed into the bag, the thieves threatened the woman and left her hut. The woman watched them go. She couldn't overpower them physically. All she could do was resign herself to her fate. As the thieves exited her house, she began to mutter strange, incomprehensible words after them. Mommy, you've got to share. Peter said, turning around to take one last look at the poor woman. She stood frozen in place in front of the open door of her house, continuously murmuring to herself in a low voice. You're a sick old lady. Peter added, looking at her. Peter, we need to hurry. Leave her. Blacksmith shouted, and then he too saw the woman standing on the threshold. She was watching them with unblinking eyes. Blacksmith could no longer make out the features of her face. Peter turned away and followed the others. That old woman is really something. She must have lost her mind, Peter said, then shifted his focus back to the bag of loot. Well, not bad for the first time, he said, shaking the bag in his hands and feeling its weight. Meanwhile, Blacksmith had already spotted another house where they thought there might also be some icons. The thieves decided not to linger in the village, but to quickly dart down one street and immediately disappear into the forest. What did she whisper to you? Blacksmith asked. Who? Peter replied, looking down at his feet. Bobby stopped again and grabbed his right side. The pain was making it hard for him to breathe. Who, who? That old lady. Blacksmith said. Don't listen to her, she was just babbling nonsense, Peter said, brushing it off as he stopped in front of a new hut. Well, who's going first, he asked, his eyes glinting with a sinister light. This time it was Blacksmith who knocked on the door. There was no response. The guy turned to Peter and said, Listen, I don't quite trust that woman. What if she's a witch or something, he asked the burly guy. Well, even if that's the case, what does it matter to us, he replied. The thing is, she could put a hex on us, Blacksmith said, glancing at Bobby. Bobby squatted down, it was hard for him to stand. Look at Bobby over there. He's completely worn out, and just yesterday he was doing fine, Blacksmith said. Quit whining. We need to get to work, Peter interjected. Turning to Bobby, he spat. Blacksmith turned to the door and was about to knock again, but it swung open by itself. An old, gray-haired man stood on the threshold. Another one. Blacksmith muttered. I mean, hello, we just need to rest for a couple of hours, he stammered in a mock English accent. The old man looked at him, then at Peter, who was standing behind, and immediately understood what was happening. He opened the door wider, turned, and walked into his hut. Sitting down on a stool by the stove, he silently watched the unexpected, uninvited guests. The three prisoners stepped into the hut and hesitated for a moment. The old man's behavior was very unfamiliar to them. Are you going to stand there all day, or are you going to get to work, the old man said. He then took a cup and started drinking hot herbal tea. The thieves were even more bewildered. The burly guy nudged Bobby in the shoulder, indicating it was his turn. Bobby gritted his teeth and stepped into the hut, turning around to find himself in a small room. 
There's nothing here, Bobby's voice came from the next room. Look harder, Peter ordered him. The old man continued to sit and sip his hot drink. Aren't you scared at all, old man? Peter asked, squatting down. Why should I be scared? I've lived my life. But how will you live yours? I don't know, the old man replied, bringing the cup to his lips again. Blacksmith was watching the old man, and his anxiety grew. He felt a tremor in his hands. Somewhere deep inside, his conscience began to trouble him. Just then, Bobby returned. After searching the entire hut and looking under every bench, he found nothing. It's all clean, there's nothing, not a gram, he said. Suddenly, a sharp pain pierced through him, and he groaned. The old man didn't glance at him. The fugitives exchanged glances. Damn it, Peter said. They all turned and left the hut. I'm telling you, that old woman must have put a curse on us, blacksmith grumbled. We're not going to have any luck, nothing is going to work out for us, he shouted. We should have left her alone, blacksmith kept on, holding his head and cursing under his breath. Well, that's enough, we're running out of time, Peter said. It's going to get light soon. Let's go into the next hut, grab everything we can, and get out of here. Agreed, he asked his robbery partners. They nodded in agreement. Blacksmith knocked on the next hut. Inside, a mother and daughter fell silent, thinking it was someone coming for Linda. It must be for me, who else could come here, the mother panicked, biting her lower lip. Mom, hide here, Maria suggested, finding a suitable spot. Another knock sounded at the door, and Maria approached and opened it. Three strangers stood on the threshold, one of them looking quite unwell. Girl, where are your parents? the burly guy asked. There's no one home, Maria replied in a thin voice. How is that possible? Peter asked, chuckling. I live alone, Maria replied, a little nervously. Thinking they were there for her mother, she offered them to come inside. Want some tea? The burly guy laughed again. Maybe, he replied and stepped inside with a wide stride. Blacksmith and Bobby followed him in. While the little girl prepared tea for them, Blacksmith wandered around the hut. In the far corner, he found several icons in gold frames. Running his fingers over them, he wiped away centuries of dust and was delighted by their golden shine. Gathering the icons in his arms, he stepped back to the others, his wide grin speaking volumes. Stuffing the icons into the bag, Blacksmith also took a seat at the table. Oh, liver pies, my favorite. Bobby exclaimed, taking a huge bite. Bobby sat with a frown, feeling nauseous and weak for over an hour. Don't be shy, Maria said, not really knowing why. Perhaps she wanted to win over what she thought were doctors. Here's some herbal tea. It's a bit cold, but it's very good for you. It'll boost your strength, she said, bustling around the table. The escapees were extremely surprised by her warm welcome. Hey, girl, you're not scared of us at all? Peter asked. Why should I be scared? I know what you're looking for, Maria replied, confident that they could never find her mom. Right, Peter said, amused, referring to the icons they had found. Enough sitting around, Bobby's hoarse voice broke in, having eaten and drunk nothing. It's time to go, we'll be late. True, Peter said, but he didn't rush to leave the hut. He had taken a liking to the girl, and a mischievous thought crept into his mind that she could be sold for a pretty penny. Girl, why don't you come with us and help us out, the burly guy suggested. Linda, who was hiding inside, heard the whole conversation. She immediately realized that these were no staff members from the psychiatric hospital. Hey. What do you say? Come with us, Peter offered again. Why? My place is here, Maria replied. How is this your place? Peter asked, intrigued. Just like that, the girl responded. My great-grandma lived and worked here, my grandma lived and worked here, and I'm going to be here too, Maria improvised on the spot. The escapees laughed. Their conversation was interrupted by a sudden knock at the window. It was the black crow. It cawed loudly and tapped its wings against the glass. 
Suddenly, the window swung open, and the crow flew into the hut, circling around the ceiling. Oh, not this again. Blacksmith exclaimed. This can't be good. It's that witch. Let's get out of here. Blacksmith panicked, getting up from the chair and stuffing pies into his pocket. Let's go, Peter commanded, grabbing Maria and dragging her toward the exit. Hearing her daughter's cries, Linda slammed her hand against the hatch and began to climb out of the oven. Covered in soot and grime, with disheveled hair, she truly looked like a frightening Baba Yaga. Witch! Blacksmith shouted. Get away from me, witch! Peter said, crossing himself as he shielded himself from the flying crow. Bobby fainted from fear and fell to the floor. Linda reached out her blackened hands toward Peter. Let go of her, or things will get worse, she said in a threatening tone. After everything she had experienced, it seemed Linda was no longer afraid of anything and definitely wasn't going to let the thieves take her daughter. Peter stood frozen, afraid to move. He could see the glowing eyes of a real witch. The crow continued to circle and caw. At that moment, another crow flew into the hut, and then another, and another. The black swarm flapped their wings chaotically, slapping the intruders across the cheeks. A sharp pain shot through Peter's body, and only a sudden shove at the door made him move. He fell. Linda loomed over him, while the crows continued to circle, flying out the door and back in again. Get away from me, witch! Peter shouted. Blacksmith tried to help him up, but he couldn't shake off the fear of what he had seen. Leaving his friend behind, he bolted, crying out for help. Peter chased after him, forgetting all about Bobby. The prisoners ran as fast as they could. Exhausted, they fell to the ground in front of a lake. Local villagers, mowing grass in the morning, spotted the men whose eyes were filled with sheer terror. They begged for help, their hands trembling, lips quivering, and their hair sticking up in fright. Help us, please. Peter cried. There's a witch, a witch, shouted Blacksmith. We'll tell everything. We'll confess to everything, just free us from this curse, Peter insisted, still covering his face with his hands. Soon, the police arrived. Conducting a nighttime raid, they discovered an empty prison cell. A search party immediately headed into the town. Shortly thereafter, they caught the escapees, who were more than happy to return to them. While investigating the escape, the police officer entered the hut where Linda and her daughter were hiding. During their conversation, Linda explained that she had been held against her will in a psychiatric hospital and forced to take powerful medications. The law enforcement officer was seriously troubled by this revelation, as the cause of the fire that had taken two lives was still not definitively known. Linda and Maria returned to Aunt Daphne and Uncle Horty's home. Antonio was placed under investigation and put in a separate cell as a particularly dangerous criminal. He didn't hesitate to confess everything to the investigator. When Father Richard returned from another city, he was assigned to work in the town where Linda had become a mother. The family lived in their little world, full of harmony and love. Richard continued his work as an engineer, while Linda lovingly took on the role of a caring mother and wife. Mr. Close, who worked as the chief doctor of the psychiatric hospital, still hoped for Richard's swift departure to another city. However, that didn't happen. The long separation from Linda, with whom he used to spend long hours talking and enjoying her company, brought him new pain each day. The object of his affection was now entirely devoted to her family and husband. This made Antonio feel anger and hatred. With each passing minute, he wished more and more to bind Linda to him, to regain their past connection and his significance in her eyes, as it had been when she was in town without her husband. Thoughts of reclaiming this woman, binding her to him, and making her listen to and trust only him turned into an obsession. Antonio was plagued by sleepless nights and torturous days, waiting for a chance encounter with her. This previously unknown, incomprehensible, and sometimes completely wild dependency on this woman filled Antonio from the inside out. One day, unable to resist any longer, Antonio visited Linda and Richard's home, taking advantage of the New Year's holidays. Under the pretense of delivering gifts for the children, Antonio knocked on the door. Oh, who's there? Linda cheerfully exclaimed, seeing her good friend at the threshold. 
Come in, Antonio. Richard will be home soon, today is a short day, the woman said, ushering the man inside. Antonio smiled widely, greeting Linda and her children. Pulling something from his red bag, he handed it to the two girls. And here's a gift from Santa Claus for you, Maria. Antonio handed a gift to Maria. And this is for you, Laura, he said, offering a shiny box to Laura, the other twin. The girls squealed with joy, barely containing their curiosity. They thanked Antonio for the gifts and glanced sideways at their mother, as if asking for permission to open them. Well, of course, open them, or you'll burst from impatience. Linda said cheerfully. Meanwhile, Antonio couldn't take his eyes off Linda. It was as if he was absorbing her energy even when just being near her. Maria and Laura went to the room to unpack their gifts. Linda invited Antonio to sit at the table. The man acted politely and calmly. He watched every movement of the woman, every turn of her head. She gently and carefully picked up the teapot and brought it to the cup, then placed cookies in a vase. All her movements were measured and soft. Antonio, Linda called the doctor again, pulling him away from his thoughts and back to reality. Oh, were you saying something? Sorry, I was distracted by your hands, Antonio replied, looking into Linda's eyes. For some reason, he thought Linda would respond to him in kind. But the woman simply repeated her question. Their pleasant conversation didn't last long. Soon Richard returned home from work. After washing up, he came into the kitchen and sat next to his wife, wrapping his arms around her waist. Antonio felt a sudden surge of jealousy that he tried to hide as he stared intently at his cup. It's about time you found a wife of your own instead of hanging around someone else's, Richard joked, hinting to Antonio that he didn't appreciate unexpected visits when her husband wasn't home, even if it was an old friend of his wife. Antonio choked on a cookie and coughed. His face flushed. It wasn't just from the rise in his blood pressure but also from a feeling of wounded and simultaneous anger. I'm working on it, Antonio replied. But what's the point of worrying? Linda and I have known each other long before you met her. Right, Linda, he asked, expecting her to take his side. But Linda didn't do that. No, I don't agree, Linda said. When two people become husband and wife, everyone else automatically takes a back seat. But that's what makes him a husband, she concluded, kissing Richard on the cheek. Richard remained serious, as if to show that he wasn't going to joke about this topic. Linda's response infuriated Antonio even more. Now he felt publicly humiliated and insulted. I think it's time for me to go, Mr. Close said, lifting his head high. Not receiving any words of protest, like, stay a little longer, be with me for a bit more, Antonio understood that Linda had crossed him out of her life. Antonio stepped out the door. His face was pale with anger and humiliation. Well, we'll see about that, he muttered under his breath as he headed home. After that meeting, Antonio couldn't forget what had happened. He couldn't allow someone who had insulted him, who had literally come between him and Linda, to speak to him like that. Antonio's body was filled with fierce hatred. On New Year's Eve, Antonio drank heavily. The day turned into evening, it was already dark outside, but it wasn't too late yet. Driven mad by the unforgivable offense that had tormented him for the last few days, he approached Linda's house. He held a gas can in his hands. Lighting a cigarette, he stood at the entrance, exhaling thick clouds of smoke. He wanted to call out to Linda, to talk to her and confess his love. She needed to understand him, after all, he had been by her side for so many years. He even forgave her for having children with another man. Remembering Richard's words from three days ago, Antonio twisted the cap off the gas can and splashed gasoline on the doors and walls of the house. Suddenly, he heard footsteps from outside. Fearing he would be caught, he tossed the can onto the roof through the unlocked attic entrance. Strangers walked by. Antonio grinned widely and then burst into nearly silent laughter. He took another long drag from his cigarette, preparing to knock on the door. But in the next moment, the door swung open, and Linda stepped out to meet him. She was on her way to get her daughter Maria, who was playing at a friend's house today. Her twin sister had stayed home. 
Last week they had a snowball fight, and now she was recovering from a sore throat. Upon seeing Antonio in his drunken state, Linda was taken aback. Antonio, she asked, not believing her eyes. Are you drunk? The woman examined his relaxed face, trying hard to maintain her composure. Linda, I can't live without you. You've taken my soul, he slurred slightly, holding the cigarette in his hands. Linda frowned. Antonio, you don't realize what you're saying. You've had too much to drink today. Go home, Linda replied hurriedly. Adjusting the scarf on her head, she walked past Antonio. He managed to grab her by the sleeve of her coat and stop her. The woman turned, expecting him to stop his ridiculous antics. Antonio took one last drag and flicked the butt aside before stepping closer to Linda, preparing to kiss her. At that moment, the cigarette butt landed on an oil stain, and in an instant, bright vertical flames erupted. For a few seconds, Linda stood in shock. Antonio saw the reflection of the burning house in her eyes. The woman rushed to the door to free her husband and daughter who were still inside. But Antonio wouldn't let her do that. Richard, fire. Linda managed to scream. In the struggle, Antonio pushed her too hard. She fell, hitting her head against a concrete post that served as a fence support. Antonio panicked, realizing he would be blamed for everything. Bracing the front door, he pretended to try to extinguish the fire. A minute later, neighbors rushed to the scene. Bringing buckets with them, they tried to put out the flames, but they had already spread throughout the entire house. Someone called the fire department. Coming to her senses, Linda couldn't quite grasp what was happening. Once she gathered her thoughts, she made it to a window on the other side. She knew that Laura and Richard were sleeping in the back room. The woman managed to break the window. She started calling her daughter's name. Laura. Richard. Linda shouted with all her might, but there was no response. The woman refused to lose hope. Finally, she heard a voice. Mom, Mom, her seven-year-old daughter Laura called out. Come to the window. Linda shouted, looking through the flames. Antonio rushed over, trying to stop her from saving her family. He grabbed her in a tight embrace, holding her back. Mom, I'm scared, Laura cried, not daring to pass through the blazing fire. Then her head started to spin, and she collapsed. Antonio dragged Linda to a safe distance, and just then one side of the roof collapsed, crushing their last hope of salvation. Soon the fire truck arrived and extinguished the flames. Unfortunately, no one was found at the scene of the fire. Linda and Maria were taken in by Aunt Daphne and Uncle Horty. They lived alone in a large house and had no children. No one was found guilty of the fire, although arson was considered as a possibility. However, due to her head injury, Linda couldn't recall how everything happened. During interrogations, her answers were unclear and uncertain. As for Antonio, he was a respected man in town, the chief doctor of the psychiatric hospital. No one could even imagine that he could have been involved in the fire. After the tragedy, Antonio began visiting Linda again. He spent long hours with her, comforting her, wanting to become what he had been in Richard's absence. The man couldn't comprehend that he could never replace her lost love. A couple of weeks after the fire, Linda began to remember how everything had unfolded. She especially recalled that before the fire started, she had been talking to Antonio, and then she saw her daughter's terrified face, heard her cries for help, and felt Antonio's strong grip preventing her from saving her child. Trusting Antonio, she confided in him about her fears. The man began to seriously worry that the truth would come out. One day, when he found Linda in tears, he heard from her what he had been afraid of. Antonio, she said, wiping her tears, when you came to visit again. I know who started the fire. Her voice took on a steely tone. Oh God, you're trembling, Antonio said, rushing to Linda and stroking her shoulders. But this time she didn't accept his comfort. Her face was swollen from crying, but she was resolute. In a cold voice, she said. I remember everything. What? What do you remember, my dear? Tell me, Antonio interrupted her. 
I remember that you were near our house that evening, Linda said. Come on, really, the man said, seeing the accusatory look in her eyes. Of course, I was there. I saved you from disaster, he insisted, trying to pull Linda closer to him. Enough, the woman replied firmly. You set our house on fire, you staged the fire to get rid of Richard, she said, raising her voice. Antonio's eyes widened in disbelief, he was shocked by her accusation. Linda, you need to calm down. You still can't think straight. I told you that you need rest, he said, and with those words, he jabbed a syringe full of medication into her shoulder, which he had been carrying with him for the past few days. Linda didn't have time to comprehend what was happening before her body began to lose strength, and she fell to the floor. Antonio caught her and laid her on the bed. As he was leaving the house, he ran into Aunt Daphne. He informed her that Linda had worsened and needed to rest. Oh, what a tragedy. Poor woman, she exclaimed, covering her mouth with her hand. I'll come by tomorrow at the same time to visit her, the doctor said, then added, I fear we are in for some sad news. Antonio left the house and returned the next day. Maria was at school, and Aunt Daphne was at work. Only Uncle Horty was home. Upon entering Linda's room, he found her lying on the bed, suffering from a headache. Antonio's first action was to give her another shot. Feeling better, he said. What did you give her? A sedative? Uncle Horty asked, wanting to find out how things were going. Antonio flinched in surprise, but quickly replied that it was just medicine for her headache and a sedative. Uncle Horty shook his head and then showed the doctor out the door. Antonio's visits became regular. After a month, he convinced Aunt Daphne that Linda needed inpatient treatment. The woman agreed. Thus, Linda fell completely under Antonio's control. By court decision, Antonio received a strict punishment in a prison cell and was stripped of his right to practice medicine. The city administration allocated a house for the affected family in place of the old one. Linda was very happy to regain her family, albeit in an incomplete form. Maria, lunch is ready. Linda called her daughter to the table. Maria kissed her mother on the cheek and sat down, pulling her plate closer. For lunch, there was her favorite borscht. You are the most precious thing I have in the whole world. Linda said. And now, enjoy your meal, she added cheerfully. Her daughter took a spoon to scoop some of the red broth. There was a knock at the door. Who could that be? Linda asked, then walked into the hallway to open the door. At the threshold stood an old gray-haired man, alongside a girl who was a spitting image of Maria. Linda's mouth dropped open. She wanted to say something but couldn't get a word out. Finally, she invited the old man into the house. But he refused. Returning the girl to her family, he went home. It turned out that the old man was no ordinary person. He had lived in the area for a long time and was well aware of every change. After the fire, he had a dream that living people remained there. So, he went to check. When he approached the site of the fire, he saw only charred beams and boards. He stood in complete silence. Snow covered everything, mixed with black ash and soot. Then his still sharp hearing caught a faint child's cry. Digging through the burned blackboards and logs, he reached the floor, specifically to the door to the cellar. Opening it, he was stunned. Seven-year-old Laura stood before him. Covered in soot, starving and exhausted, she somehow managed to survive. The old man took her in, treated her, and gave her herbal teas before wanting to return Laura to her mother. However, he heard rumors that her mother had been placed in a psychiatric hospital. This can't be good, the old man decided, as Laura could easily become the next victim of deceit. The old man was wise and calculated his moves ahead. He saw and heard everything and knew how to proceed. And now, with the culprit punished and Linda back to her previous life, he brought the girl home safe and sound. Thus, Linda's hallucinations ceased, and the children regained their mother.